Hello and welcome to the Lightroom's inaugural summit. The Lightroom was brought to life just a couple of months ago by five individuals, Adrian Bolt, Andreas Eaton, Carolina Danko, Martin Hasbro and myself, a group of people who, are, who strongly believe there is no better time than now to create this platform for digital innovation. Today, our main goal is to get the ball rolling by starting the discussion with different individuals from within the art world getting to know the needs of the entire ecosystem. This is hopefully the first of many, many events to come. We're incredibly fortunate to have some amazing guests lined up for you today. However, seeing as this is our very first event, we'll sadly only be able to scratch the surface. So we look forward to you all joining us on this adventure. Thank you all for being here with us today. And now a short message from our president, Carolina. Hello, my name is Carolina Denko and I am the co-owner of this gallery, Karma International. I am also the president and co-founder of the Lightroom. I studied art history here in Zurich and that's also where I met my partner, Marina. Uh, we then together um, founded Karma International as a non-for-profit. It was more of a curatorial a platform to show the artists that we really liked and uh, this project organically grew and grew and became bigger and after two years we decided to um, really start a commercial gallery and work closely with the artists that we loved like Pamela Rosenkranz, Ida Eckblatt, Martin Soto Clement and these are still at the core of our gallery and we expanded a lot since and it's been the greatest journey for both of us. The Lightroom has been founded by five individuals from all very different backgrounds with the idea to create an exchange between the art world and the tech sector and to facilitate the dialogue. So with this event, we're kicking off the initiative of the Lightroom. We're bringing together some brilliant minds from both the art world and the tech industry and hearing their unique perspectives. This is just a first glance at the state of the art right now. And then we're going to develop all of our strategies further. Hello for me as well, and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Miriam Veitch, and I will be taking you to, through the next two hours. Um, I'm the head of marketing and development at Kunstmuseum Basel and part of the board, and had the pleasure of working at uh, Fonas and Weile for the past 10 years and uh, as a digital communications manager. Some words for the, about the schedule. Some of the inputs of the next few hours have been pre-recorded. Others will be live and you're always welcome to use the chat function to interact and we will hopefully get to as many questions as possible. Uh, just some housekeeping. We are uh, recording this event and we'll be uploading it in the next uh, days and you will be informed about it as soon as it, it is online with a follow-up email. I am now very pleased to introduce our, our keynote speaker, Dirk Boll. Um, as probably most of you know, Dirk Boll is the um, a, um, appointed president of Christie's of Europe, Middle East, Russia and India uh, since 2017 and has been with Christie's since 1998. He has published several books and his last, last called Was diesmal anders is, what is different this time, where he looks at the art market and also how it has been forced to reinvent, change and innovate uh, through crises. And knowing that Dirk has um, pr uh, prepared a presentation full of uh, amazing insights, uh, I will now hand over to you. Please, Dirk. Thank you, Miriam. Good evening and welcome, everybody. Thank you for having me talking tonight about the art markets in 2020 and what the crisis meant for our world. Um, I think we can put up the first slide if we can. Wonderful. Um, I think you all remembered what happened last year. Uh, no need to lecture you here. Just as a reminder, the first quarter was, at least in the Western world, fairly normal. It wasn't in the East 
And what you see here is a little timeline um, how important marketplaces for art closed down one after the other. And at the end of March, there was a total lockdown in every single art trading center of this world, be it London, New York, Paris, Hong Kong. Um, as you can imagine, that's been an issue for an industry that is actually based on the cult of the original. You want to see the work you buy. Um, and overnight, every single platform that was analog and had been existed since the 18th century wasn't able uh, to perform anymore. So there were no auctions, um, there were no gallery visits, there were no art fairs. Um, the um, industry was um, well, caught in the act, it was a difficult moment because most of the industry players were um, badly prepared. Some auction houses had actually established online only sales branches or arms. Um, many galleries had not, um, most fairs had not. So what we saw was a disruption in the art world that is comparable to the disruption of the internet in other industries, but only 20 years later. So what internet did to say the distribution of goods or uh, like books or, or clothing um, had not really touched our industry because it had a strong event side. It had a strong, as I said, cult of the original. You wanted to see the original work. Um, and also it was quite centered to the um, few marketplaces I had just named. And this all came to an end, end of March 2020. Um, everybody moved home. Um, the whole industry was working from home for at least three to four months. Um, and we had to find our feet again. What happened? Larger companies were able to fall back on their internet uh, ability, on their internet departments who could present works to the market online only. Um, that was one aspect we are looking into detail. Um, the other aspect was that we saw a huge number of collaboration between various parts of the industry. So galleries, secondary market trade, auction houses work together, um, but also between the commercial side of the art world and the non-profit side. The interesting thing is the uh, consummation of art um, didn't really go back in total. Um, it was just acquired through different channels. This is true for some um, trade uh, uh, outlets more than for others. Um, and of course, since auctions lend themselves towards online only business, it was a bit easier for auction houses across the globe on all levels of the market to perform that. But when you look at that breakdown, um, of um, the outlets where art was purchased last year, you still see that dealerships and primary market galleries, as well as analog auctions, live auctions, are the two leading formats. And the reason for that is, as I said, the first quarter was pretty normal business, at least in the Western world. And in summer and then in December, again, we had some um, corridors where we could perform live auctions. But then when you go down that little list here, you see the next is already an online only tool. So 38% um, of all artworks were acquired through a gallery's website or an online viewing room. The same is true for artist studios because they had to be closed during lockdown as well. This is around Zoom meetings and essentially mail order. Um, art fairs, of course, um, opened online viewing rooms. Art Basel was the first in Hong Kong in spring. Um, these online viewing rooms developed quickly um, to a interesting commercial tool that added a new layer of transparency to the market because you can now um, enter these online viewing rooms. You can see, uh, you can sort the offers. You can look at the galleries you like. Um, you can um, search for artists you're interested in, you collect, or you can look within the frame of your spending potential because um, for the first time ever, almost every single um, gallery is pricing, at least in a certain frame, if not uh, in a precise um, pricing. Um, another big increase in sell-through happened through third-party platforms. These are aggregational platforms who actually combine offerings. Um, you can find that in the gallery world, but the prime example is um, 
auction platforms uh, aggregated by a third party. This is something where mid-market companies really benefited from. And you see here, um, they are high up on the ranking of outlets of 2020. Um, I won't go through the whole list. Um, I think one example is, is um, noteworthy. About one third of all acquisitions of all collectors also bought from Instagram. So Instagram having been a direct um, yeah, selling channel before, mainly a marketing channel, but also a direct sales, um, made a big leap and many artists started to sell directly. Many collectors started to buy directly. There was also a bit of an anti-movement to that and um, some artists stopped promoting their own work on Instagram or would only show details of their work, um, hoping to channel the collecting interest to their gallery websites or their own websites. When we look at more precise numbers, I can only offer you the Christie's numbers, um, but I think they are quite interesting. You can see that lockdowns that would close auction houses for um, eight months of the year reduced our live sales, where you have an auctioneer in the room and the public in the room by almost half, and you see a lot of um, increase in the online form. So what happened in spring 2020 was that um, whatever could be moved, so whatever was in a warehouse, had been photographed, had been catalogued and condition reported, was moved towards an online platform as long as the vendor would agree to that. Um, and you could see a, um, an increase, a flood of new online formats. Um, this is true for all auction houses. Uh, the offers were increased, but also the formats were tweaked, developed. Um, the offers were sliced in a different way. The market became more fluid over the first two, three months of the lockdown. And as a result, the number of online only sales went up massively. Overall, the market shrunk. You can see that um, the number of lots offered went down. And I think what is particularly interesting is that the masterpiece level of the market um, had the biggest um, step back of 42%. Um, that that actually, I'm sorry, 42% that actually um, is is the, the, the reduction of sales of works in the region of $5 million plus. The reason for that is um, the transacting on that level needs the physical inspection that wasn't possible in spring. So the prestigious New York May season completely fell flat as fell flat Art Basel in June, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So on that level, um, the the there was the biggest decrease in turnovers. Interestingly enough, the online development um, helped to lower the threshold of the art markets, and I think everybody who was out there would find um, an increasing number of new buyers and younger buyers. And this is actually um, the 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 lifeblood of the markets. And um, at the same time, you could see that the crisis hadn't taken away um, the wealth of the collecting crowd. Um, and I think this is true throughout the levels of the market. And um, there was a strong demand for art that came to the market. And um, you can see on the uh, results uh, column that actually only in the region between $20,000 and $5 million, you had a decrease in turnover. This is now a little overview how that development is to be looked at in a wider time frame. Um, and you can see every curve goes up and the, the breaking point is exactly when Corona came. So this was the moment when um, the disruption happened. Um, it is not only the number of online auctions, it is the number of um, online lots as a percentage of total lots offered. It is the average lot value. It is the number of buyers and bidders. It is the number of um, countries where people came from to take part in the market. Every figure went up. Um, it is interesting because you could um, call it the um, democratization of the markets. Um, maybe we don't go that far because you've seen there is a certain value threshold at the bottom, but still um, it is the breakthrough moment in March or in spring 2020. I give you two examples for 
um, prices. And of course, it's easy to have high prices. Therefore, I excluded the um, London spring season. But um, for purpose of comparison, we sold in January that Lowry painting. Uh, it made 2.6 million pounds in a live sale. The, the room was crowded. Corona was still far away. Um, and as a comparison, the uh, diamond we sold online only in June made 4 million. This is a bit of a of a, of, a, of a crazy comparison because it isn't a comparison. Um, it is just to show you that the um, the uh, gray zone in between the online only and the live format, the glass ceiling that was there around $10,000 in the old days has been thrown away and pushed away by Corona. Um, when we think about collectors taking part in online platforms, um, you see here the breakdown um, of collectors using these platforms. And I think it's interesting to see that um, despite the high figures of acquisition of social media, um, it is actually mainly Instagram um, and other platforms haven't been able to um, take part in that success. Um, and you still see the stability between um, the uh, the gallery websites, the um, online viewing rooms of galleries and fairs, and the online auctions. It is actually quite evenly spread. When we look at who are the buyers of the art markets, I have to return to Christie's data because these are the only ones accessible to me. Um, but it was interesting that um, of all buyers at Christie's, more than a third were new to Christie's across all the sales channels. And about a third of that group were from the millennial generation. So when we compare that to older data, we can say it is actually a big breakthrough to reach out to a younger audience. Unsurprisingly, internet savvy, um, easily buying online only without a physical viewing. And that's a big differenti differentiation between them and say their parents' generation. Um, the um, first time online buyers um, was at Christie's up by 228% year on year. That's the biggest increase um, obviously we ever had. Um, interestingly enough, the spread between the three regions we are using to administrate our company, Americas, the Asia Pacific and um, Europe, Middle East and Africa shows the biggest increase in EMEA. Um, I think one region, uh, one reason for that is the borders within Europe and the um, the the, the um, limitation that gave to people to move around um, because every single legislation, every nation had their own um, ruling around um, how to move um, and how to execute art market platforms. Um, what um, turns back to the democratization and the globalization of this market is that registrants to Christie sales went up from 61 countries to 101 countries in 2020, so 40% more. Um, that is um, an interesting fact because it is a breakthrough in attracting people who are not used to these platforms because they live in the big cities, in the big centers where art market is taking place um, or travel to that regularly. Um, last but not least, after lockdown started, seven of the 10 top lots, that's the most expensive top, uh, lots we sold, were actually acquired by clients who transacted the first time online with us. Um, nowadays, with a KYC procedure in place, you have fairly um, rich data, fairly precise data, so you know who's transacting with you. And the conversion of clients who had been transacting only analog in the past into online clients was absolutely massive. And not only in the younger generation where you would expect it, but also in older generations, which is politically incorrect to say nowadays, but still data is data. So in the age bracket of the 60 year old clients, we had 75% of our clients um, were converted from um, analog only clients. And in the 70s, uh, you still had more than two thirds. So 70 year plus clients, um, two thirds of them were able or willing to convert into online only acquisition. Yeah, here you can see that this is an interesting um, uh, uh, spread across collecting fields. 
uh, these are abbreviations um, that only make sense to auction house or gallery people, but you have Asian works of art, you have decorative art, you have impressions on modern, you have luxury, you have old masters, and you have post-war and contemporary art. Um, and one aspect is the key aspect on that slide, actually. It is that um, the online bidders are in each category more than two-thirds. How was that all possible? Again, this is a list of Christie's steps, but this is what happened in every auction house, in every larger gallery business, um, in all the fairs. This is what um, improved the, 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 the digital offers to an extent nobody had foreseen before this crisis, before that catalyst moment of our industry. Um, you would see a great improvement of um, client relationship management. Um, this is, of course, all about IT, it's all about data analysis, understanding who is in engaging with you. Um, and that led to the fact, for example, when you enter the Christie's website nowadays, you have a banner of um, centralized information our marketing team feels everybody should see. But below that and above that, um, the website looks for everybody different depending on um, what is your browsing history, what does our computer the algorithm feel you are interested in. Um, the same goes for uh, digital advertising. This is the banner advertising you will see when you browse the web that um, people who want to sell to you, um, advertise to you and follow you through the web. Um, this is limited by data protection regulation um, in the European Union, but actually across the Western world. Um, it is an interesting tool because it is something that is um, catering to the customer's interest and, 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 and um, re reflecting the customer's browsing and interest history. Um, and in 2020, it has almost entirely replaced um, printed advertising. Um, the, the companies are going back to that a tiny bit, but the pendulum will not swing back um, in, uh, to, a, to a move uh, or to an extent we saw before that catalyst moment. Um, WeChat is, a, is an application um, in, 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 in Asia um, that is actually like, a, like, a, like a, um, a, a framework of many other applications. So Asian collectors can do a lot of um, shopping or services booking or orderings in WeChat. And WeChat is the number one um, selling channel in Asia, predominantly in mainland China. This is something um, the art markets have recognized and are nowadays using. At the same time, what is offered uh, through these channels has been um, increased in depth, in content, in, in uh, functionality. So when you, when you enter these channels, what, what you can find there is so much more than it was or it used to be only a year ago. Um, and this is, of course, not only um, transmitted through um, websites of companies, of art fairs, of auction houses, but also via social media. Um, what you can see there is also improved in its quality. Um, the online viewing rooms starting kind of looking like a PDF uh, and, 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 and also auction catalogs um, in many places, especially in the mid-market, having had a bit of a PDF character, have expanded, um, have a three-dimensionality nowadays. Um, you can do um, your own 360-degree tour through these exhibitions, through these online viewing rooms. Um, you have um, um, virtual features. You have video interviews. Um, it is a very rich content that is um, presented, but also you can um, place uh, with augmented reality items for sale from an online viewing room of a fair or items in an auction um, and have a look at your iPad, how is it looking at home um, to make up for the fact that you actually couldn't go at least in 2020 and for the, for the better part of this year so far um, and, 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 and look at the piece in the flesh as we call it, um, which always makes it a bit more difficult to understand proportions and how items work in a room, look in a room. Um, to understand condition, um, the industry has increased the um, photography and the um, zoom capability of um, data. And um, 
this this uh, whole concept is kind of rounded up um, with online only events because not only that you couldn't have a fair not only you couldn't have an auction of course you couldn't have an event i mean a physical event that is um, what did that do to our client base or to the client base of the art markets um, one year later the client base or the active the number of active clients or the 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 quality of the active clients is uh, different um, the average age of clients has gone down that's very interesting um, and 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 closely connected to the digitalization of that happened in 2020 um, there is a higher turnaround of clients and as you can imagine this is something that is important for a commercial entity as it is for an institution you need to find new collectors you need to create new art buyers uh, and art lovers um, the client base is much broader because the, the the threshold is lowered by online tools many people are um, well easily browsing a gallery website but aren't entirely comfortable to enter a physical gallery space and the same is true for taking part in an auction and of course it's increasingly digital because um the 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 the, the clients the collectors who wanted to buy in 2020 um had little opportunity for the majority of month in this year and um so 70 percent of all clients transacting last year um have transacted online only and that means i want to remind you that there is no way of having a look at the original beforehand um, and that was only around 40 percent five years ago yeah um, i spoke about the 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 glass ceiling of online only sales in the past the online only auctions were seen as kind of the bread and butter business the lower end the lower value end and average prices were industry-wide below ten thousand um, dollars that had changed uh, the uh, average price now are trending prices are now trending between 40 and fifty thousand dollars and what you can see is another lowry uh, this was the um, the highest price a work of art fetched at Christie's online only without viewing um, in 2020. And you see the price is comparable to the price fetched in January for a comparable painting. Um, and when you look back one year ahead, or one year ago, the, the highest price in 2019 was just um, about a third of that, 791,000 for this Banksy. I know you cannot compare these two works. So what happened to the sale rooms um, in that period? There was a certain anxiety that our whole industry would go online only, um, at least for the auction part of the industry that kind of seemed to be possible. It was much more difficult for art fairs um, because we love to go to art fairs. We love to meet our friends, our, our professional contacts there. It's a great platform for entertaining, for meeting people, for exchanging information, um, much more than auctions actually are. And what we've seen um, in the auction room is that a certain percentage over years had moved to telephone bidding um, anyway. So the big um, aim, at least at Christie's, was that we wanted to protect the auction room. We wanted to try to maintain the aura of the place as a, as a high value platform. Um, and therefore we created what we um, called the one sale. This was a sale that started in Hong Kong and moved in real time via Paris and London to New York. Altogether, it took two hours with four auctioneers in four places, and that became a bit of a role model. Um, and since then, auction houses do stream, but also do combine various auction rooms. You could see a difference in the modeling of these sales. Um, Sotheby's introduced um, an amazing television studio. You see it here, Oliver Barker, their head auctioneer um, in London. So the auctioneer is always in that studio, whilst at Christie's, the auctioneer is always kind of with the public, um, access permitted, no matter whether it's Paris, London, Hong Kong, or New York. Um, and whilst the auction room looks kind of a bit um, well, unhappy with so few people and you're only allowed six bubbles and that might be, or usually uh, that might be 12 people, not more. Um, we are of course all hoping that um, with the progress of vaccination, we'll see more people in the uh, returning to the auction room at some point this year. 
Um, I spoke initially about new collaborations. Um, this is something particularly the larger um, market players did. So the bigger galleries, the auction houses, we all did charity works. We The, the auction houses would do charity auctions. Um, we would host events. Uh, we would open the platforms, the, the digital platforms to smaller partners who didn't have the funds or the or the headcount to create these platforms. And you see a little list here of events and, and, and um, uh, charity sales or also commercial sales for fairs that happened in 2020. I would say this is uh, an interesting step to reform the structure of the art market. So in the coming years, we will see many more collaborations between uh, different parts of the industry that had been strictly divided so far. Um, and I'm very happy about that. I think it's a, it's, it's a good way. Of course, when you speak about an online only art market, you need to think about digital art. Um, this is something that is not as new as the, as the online breakthrough of 2020. Um, Christie sold the first AI work ever back in 2018. That is um, Edmond Bellamy on the left hand side. And today, uh, bidding just closed on the first NFT artwork, uh, which came in at just above $69 million, um, payable in dollars or in crypto, according to taste. Yeah, and this is actually my um, last slide because it tells me that I'm through um, and um, I'm around if you have questions for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dirk. There is actually one question that came in from Diana Segantini, apart from saying hello to you. Um, Hi, Diana. She, <laughs> she's seen the many green rising curves of digital sales. And what will the new normal look like at auction houses? Well, I think we, we still have to differentiate between the value levels. Overall, I expect the majority of items to sell online only. Um, but this will be the lower end, lower in inverted commas. And of course, there will be an overlap between um, online only in value and physical. And this depends on the collecting field because some collecting fields um, are much easier to, to, to be sold online. When you think about um, prints, editions, um, post when contemporary art in principle, because people are used to these oeuvres, people have seen other works by these artists, it's easier to um, translate an, a digital image into um, your own impression of what the piece is or might be. Um, whilst when you think about um, decorative arts, when you think about a house sale where actually patina plays a role, when you think about antiquity, um, here you might see even in lower value brackets, a physical sale for quite a while. But as I said, 50-50 is my prognosis. So online and also data won't be taking over just yet? Oh, well, data has taken over a while ago. March 2020, yeah. the latest. So is data the new currency? Apart, you know, has data as a currency taken over from personal relationships or trust as such? I wouldn't say so because because um, data helps you um, in the first place to sell something, to identify who's interested, who has shown interest, um, and it allows you to take informed decisions whilst being entrusted with the sale of a precious object of something um, the vendor, the collector loves, um, still I would think and I would hope needs a personal relationship or is at least helped by a personal relationship. Okay, thank you so much. As we've sort of um, advanced in time a little bit, I am told to move on. And thank you very much, Dirk. I'm sure we could have um, continued for quite some time. Uh, and congratulations here again on that historic success with B4. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, next up is a pre-recorded video by with Bernadine Bruck, uh, Brucker, who had extensive experience in art institutions before funding her startup Vastari, based in London. Followed by the perspective of the artist Charia Nashad, who is known for working across all medias and talking about the challenges and opportunities this bears. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Bernadine Brucker-Weeder and I am the CEO of Vastari in London. 
We are an online marketplace that facilitates exhibition loans and tours for private collectors, museums, exhibition producers and curators from around the world. I am delighted to be here today with you and to talk about art and technology. Building a digital business in this industry needs a strong inspiration. What happened to me was that I was managing an art gallery in London and some of our customers would walk into the gallery and express disappointment that a museum exhibition had been made where they hadn't been contacted for uh, lending a piece. And if you thought about the oeuvre of the artist, it would have been very valuable to have that piece in the exhibition. I started investigating how that currently works and whether they would be able to make their works available next time. And the truth was I found that the industry relies on little black books and word of mouth to curate its exhibitions. I felt that that was an inefficient system, an inaccessible system, and a system that would always not tell the complete story. So I decided to build this business. I already had a foothold in the industry when I decided to found Vastari because I was managing a gallery, I was attending art fairs, and I was interacting with collectors. I had also been working in designing museums in New York. However, it's a very different story when you are starting to build a business versus working for one. I think that in some cases in our industry, there is an advantage if you come from a privileged background when you are developing a digital business because people open doors for you, maybe because of their ulterior motives, but they open the doors. And when you're starting out, like myself, as someone who grew up in the Dominican Republic, trying to meet people all around the world, it takes a powerful story to break down that door and a lot of persistence. I really feel that where startups in Silicon Valley take six months to build an MVP, in the art world, it can take 10 times as long. Over the past nearly a decade that I've been now working on Vastari and its idea, I've discovered that incumbents are interested by innovation, but that the infrastructure for innovation really permeating into the industry doesn't exist. And specifically, I think that we need to work on the M&A side of things in terms of thinking about exits, thinking about strategies for how companies that have innovated can integrate with the incumbents in order to build them bigger. Currently, most of the companies that have succeeded in the digital art space have to build their own silo and they interact with the incumbents, but they do not become part of the incumbents. I think that if we are going to build something stronger, we need to build the investment space, not just for the early stage where you get the angel investors involved and have funds that support the innovation, but also for the later stage when you're thinking about where will this company go, where can it make the most impact, and who can ultimately pay for that company to get to an exit. Given the size of our industry, given the amount of investment that has been lost over the years because of the failure of this to happen, I think that this is an issue that should immediately be addressed by the incumbents. And then there is so much that can happen because you're empowering those companies that are innovating to grow into the norms of the sector. The art industry is very unique in the way that it works and the mechanisms. However, every single client and customer within the art industry thinks they are special. And that is different from any other industry because what, for example, a SaaS subscription as a service company or a, uh, a, a scalable digital offering needs is consistent and scalable, repeatable business. And unfortunately, in our industry, everyone's used to a bespoke approach. So I think that the biggest thing that we need to work on as an industry um, is making people aware that to make things more affordable and more um, repeatable, we also have to sometimes work within a formula. 
And then you can innovate within that formula. But we cannot build bespoke technological systems for every single issue that we are dealing with. When I read about the Lightroom and its very intelligent combination between the for-profit sector, the non-profit drivers, and the way that you could build an infrastructure to help this industry, I was very inspired. I think that we can all learn from each other in terms of the technology businesses for the art sector, but also our investors can learn from each other. Our customers can learn from each other. And by building an infrastructure where there is more dialogue, where conversations can take place and where lessons can be shared, I think that there is a lot of potential for growth for the industry. I believe that art can exist digitally as well as physically, and we need to define how those experiences are interacted with, both from a sustainable financial point of view, a sustainable point of view for the climate, and also sustainable for the art to help creativity really grow. I really believe that art and tech are meant to be together. And I look forward to seeing what comes from all of the meetings of the minds that are happening now. So enough about that. Without further ado, thank you for listening to my story and let's have a great day. Hi, my name is Shaya Nashat. I'm a visual artist. I live in Los Angeles. I grew up in uh, Geneva in Switzerland, but I've been um, in the US for the past uh, six years, previously in Berlin. Um, I worked with a lot of different uh, medias, including sculpture, um, video, film, sound, um, printing, books. Um, I don't know that it's true that uh, the art world is antiquated. I think that um, if anything, like we've seen in the past, like 50 years moments where like, you know, art forms like video who had zero currency in terms of like collectability become like, um, you know, like items that, you know, like institutions and uh, private collectors as well want to own. It's true that, you know, painting is, has the, the, this kind of like definitive status of the artwork and no one will ever come and say, this painting is not art. They might say it's bad art, but they won't say it's not art. Whereas like still today with like, you know, new technologies, there, there is a, there is a, you know, there is still a gap between, you know, a sculpture or a painting and like, like a, I don't know, a digital installation that involves like moving image is not necessarily something people really understand as, as, as being able to have a commercial value. I mean, having been in the U.S. for six years, I also see the super ugly side of, you know, like what you call the art industry, which is just like, you know, like a very speculative um, kind of market with people who are not really educated in art, but are just interested in art as a, as a way to invest their money and to acquire social status. I'm fortunate enough to not make the kind of work that would attract, um, you know, people like this, because, you know, there's some complications with my work that make that the people who want to discuss with me are like people who actually really care about art. But um, it is it is a very strong business model that is, you know, like completely unregulated and um, and where a lot of players don't actually really know what they do, they're going to throw a lot of money at artists who just come up and then disappear within like two years. And, but you know, it's their money. Like, so if that's how they want to deal with it, it just creates more like turbulences on our side, because of course, um, even if you don't pay attention to this, like there is some kind of impact that it has on, on you or your community or like your dealers, or even as a, as a young artist, when you see what you know, is out there, it can be either completely paralyzing or, or like it can change your vision of like what kind of art you should make. And that can be really tricky as well. I was excited when Martin Hatterburg told me about the Lightroom. I'm not exact, I'm not exactly sure where, where it wants to go, but for an artist to be able to have access to, you know, what the 
possibilities of like new technologies are in at a very advanced level is um is really interesting especially that you know like at least you know like in visual arts when it comes to technology like we we kind of get the things a little bit at the end of the the you know the the train like it it's like if you think of like special effects for instance it has to go through like the film industry first where which, because it's so expensive and then like we get like little bits and pieces and which makes like really interesting things because then you become more like you know um creative or resourceful but um if i was able to work with you know like directly with with whoever has you know like um like an intelligence or like a knowledge of like things that are about to be developed or could happen in the near future and be able to like think about how I can make work with this it's quite amazing and um i remember i visited the 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 media lab at uh, MIT um a few years ago and you know like it was kind of like really amazing to see what they're doing with like prosthesis and like you know like robots and stuff like that and and it was you know just a courtesy visit but um if i had been able to collaborate with them it, it could have been super interesting i think like crazy people meeting other crazy people is always interesting like you know people who know they're doing something but they don't really know why just yet so like working with <clears throat> you know like innovative startups at least to, just to be exposed to what they're doing is is really interesting for an artist Uh thank you. Um next up is Cosmin Ene, founder of Laterpay and contributor to. Um Cosmin, please introduce yourself and your platforms briefly and maybe to set the stage um share your definition of the art world which we talked about yesterday. I think that gives quite a good uh, sort of intro into your passion behind what you do. Thank you Miriam. Um, well, let me just start maybe with uh, one minute on later pay and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about contributor and then come to your point. I think if, if the internet had one original sin, it would be that it promoted the totally false belief that everything is free, which is certainly not the case. And unfortunately, we, we grew so accustomed to getting content online for free that we perceived value of that content to be reduced to zero. And with later pay, we make it as simple as possible for users to buy, contribute, and donate for digital goods and services. Um, with one click, users can commit to a purchase, and later pay aggregates those commitments, only asking for registration and payment whenever people hit a threshold of five dollars or five Swiss francs or whatever the currency is. By doing that, we onboard users into paying customers at a high rate, like in a in a range of 85 to 93 percent, which is which is very high, and that's much more than traditional upfront payment and registration would bring you. Uh, just think of yourself if you want to read an article and someone hits you with a paywall, usually you just walk away. So we just make that experience a one-click experience and very easy. And regarding Contribute2, we have built Contribute2 to, to empower creators and support their passions. Because I believe and we believe that making a contribution should be just as easy as, as leaving a like. And so we thought about bringing the power of a platform behind a link, not create a second, second Instagram, which would be crazy and you, you wouldn't get there anyway, but just give people a link that would empower them to raise or to make money from, from their existing audience. Um, so Contribute2 is a very easy way for artists to share their work online alongside a tool that allows them to take voluntary payments from people who would want to support their cause or a project or their work, um, should they like it. And the Contribute2 link, like Contribute2, your name, uh, launches a card, almost like a business card, which artists can place on any platform they are on from social media platforms to WhatsApp to iMessage to um, email and make money from it. So again, this is not a social media platform. We just leverage the artist's social media reach and existing networks by making it easy for them to, uh, to make contributions um, instantly. And then we added a little bit of magic to that with the help of uh, Nicola Ernie, who is a collector and entrepreneur um, who brought up the idea to bring patronage to 
the internet and, and make it easy to match contributions made to people. So whenever someone is making a contribution to the artist, a private individual like Nicola or a company can match that contribution and essentially uh, leverage the, the, the power of, uh, of, of patronage. So that's what I do. And you asked me about my definition of the art world. Uh, it was interesting because everyone talks about the art world, but what I, what I, what I found out is that everyone means the two to three percent in the art world who have representation of some kind, like gallery representation, and who's actually really making some money. But then I discovered that there's another chunk of 95% of the market uh, that doesn't even have a name. So the industry, uh, and I understand that it doesn't refer to itself as an industry, but the industry has established artists. It has upcoming and emerging artists, but there is not even a name for the 95% um, of, of the market. And so uh, that, that puzzled me, but also that inspires me to um, uh, to, to bring our technology to life and support uh, people in, in this environment. What do you find were the main differences in founding in the founding phases of these two uh, platforms you built and how could a uh, platform like Lightroom have supported you there? And, yeah. Well, you know, when you think about publishing and we, we were addressing publishing with, uh, with Letape in the beginning, uh, publishing was an industry that was crying out for tools that would make them money, but then they shy away from everything that's not subscription. Um, the art world was different. Everyone was a little bit more careful, but once people get to see the tool and start to use it, they're pretty um, enthusiastic about it. So it was way easier to actually work with people in, uh, in the art world. So that was definitely a very refreshing experience. Absolutely. Um, and which lesson, I mean, the last, uh, you know, 12 months, as we all know, have given the, the push for digital platforms and which, le uh, which lessons have you learned in the past six months or so? Well, a couple of them. Uh, the, the one is I learned that women are massively underrepresented in, in this market uh, with uh, if I got the numbers right, 11% uh, of all acquisitions in 40%, 14% of all exhibitions at the most prominent uh, US museums over the last decade or so were of work by female artists. So that really surprised me. So this whole pandemic totally make, made things way more transparent and accessible to people uh, like myself in the tech world than, than, um, uh, than before. Uh, another thing is that I learned that this entire market is built on people supporting artists. This entire art market was always built on patronage. And that's been going on since the Medici hundreds of years ago. It's the basis for everything that we see today. And so when, when Nicola um, said we should you know, think about taking the idea of patronage and, and, and revising that, like turning to uh, to patronage 2.0 to democratize it and make it easy for people to support artists by leveraging the power of the internet. Uh, that's, that's a new thought and it, it strikes me as, uh, it puzzles me that it didn't you know, come up before or it's not something that's, a, it's a common concept in the market. Um, also tied to the fact that um, the, the, the art world as I defined it before, doesn't really have a way to permeate to the, you know, a few of the 95% that I mentioned before, so that there's not really an exchange between those worlds. And this is definitely something that we are seeing right now because everyone is in lockdown, things like NFT come up and, and um, people start engaging because they are forced to with new technologies and start potentially embracing the concept of leaving that safe area that they lived in and, and, and look maybe in the, in the, in the lower levels, what's, what's happening there. Excellent. These are just two of the things uh, we learned. Absolutely. Um, uh, to wrap this up, what do you think are the biggest challenges that lie ahead of you? Well, you know, what, what we've built is a tool and, and people need to do some work to put it to use. And we've learned that also the, the hard way over the last few months, like tools are powerful. So if, you know, if you're a hammer, everything is a nail to you. But 
as a tool, you also need a purpose. You need to find, as an artist, as a creator, a purpose that gets you out of bed. You need to do some work to put that out there in front of people because to stay with a hammer, if you just put a hammer next to a nail, nothing happens. So people need to start using those tools uh, and embrace them and, and talk about them and be vocal to their networks. And then uh, you will get a lot of support. Like we got also a lot of um, support along along the way. We've we've talked to a few people in the arts um, industry, and the amazing uh, reaction from from the uh, from the cultural sector really fueled uh, um, our, our mission here. So we spoke to Rashi Johnson, to Nick Knight, and when we explained that to them, they were super thrilled about it and immediately recommended artists who they think should get the support. So the the challenge is to get people to use those tools, get familiar with them, and uh, to you know, put, put this out there and be vocal about it. And um, I think then you will see a chain reaction uh, because it's open, it's on the internet. Think of it as an exhibition. Instead of doing an exhibition to a few hundred people, you're now exhibiting in front of um, you know, the whole social media community, but you need to point people at that. Excellent. Thank you so much for this great input. Uh, very much looking forward to everything to come. Thank you, Cosmin. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Martin Hartebuhr. I'm one of the five co-founders of The Lightroom. It's a great pleasure to talk to you today, and I really hope you enjoy our summit. I'm an attorney at law, a lawyer, and also president of the Kunsthalle Basel, and involved in different arts institutions all over the world and also an art collector. I'm very much fascinated by the evolution of the art market. When I started to be interested in art in the early 90s, the art market was very small. I got involved in the Kunsthalle, which had an international aura, but was quite local in its visitors. Art Basel was international, but also local. Since then, the art market evolved dramatically. Many, many individuals from all over the world are interested in art, also in making money by dealing in art. Which you like, you don't like, it's a fact and we have to embrace it. I think it's one of the only sectors which I know which became very global in a very short time. And this is what I'm fascinated about. You meet a lot of interesting people and you get to know a lot of very great ideas. What we want to achieve with the Lightroom is that despite the globalization of the art market, we think and believe that the business practices of the art market are still quite old fashioned. And the art market is very cautious towards innovation and new ideas. We believe that with the Lightroom, we found a way to counterfeit this. First, we would like to listen to the art market, to the players in the art market to find out what the problems, what the needs of the art markets are. And then we will build up our own ecosystem between the members of the Lightroom, who are the players in the art market mostly, and the startup, the tech entrepreneurs in digital art. We then bring them together so we can find out what is the most easiest way to solve the problems the art market may have. This way, the startups, the tech entrepreneurs, who are the problem solvers, get much quicker to the root of the problem and learn directly from the members of the Lightroom. To enable anyone to become part of our community, we kept our yearly membership fee very low. It's only 100 Swiss francs a year and everyone who is not yet a member should become a member now. We talked about what we would like to achieve with the Lightroom and now I want to tell you how we would like to achieve it. Once we know our members, we know the needs of the art market, we can start with the idea process, which means that we would like to invite a pre-selected group of startup tech entrepreneurs to gather together at one place for a several week program. At the end of the program, we have the opportunity to select the best prototypes and develop them further. I really hope that you 
find our ideas as promising and interesting as we do. And thank you very much for participating at this summit. Now I would like to welcome our three panelists, Elena Filipovic, Stefan von Barta and Mats Thompson. At the same time, I would like to remind you that you are welcome to uh, post your questions. Um, so and I'll pick them up and post to the panel. Please, uh, Elena, could you all briefly, uh, you could you kick it off and, uh, and all of you briefly introduce yourself and what you do in the art world. Uh, my name is Elena Filipovic. I'm the director and curator of Kunsthalle Basel, a 180-year-old institution that has been, from its origins, committed to the art of the present. Thank you. Um, Matt? Yeah, hello everyone. My name is uh, Matt Thompson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of My Art Bank, and we are digitalizing the art market by trying to disrupt the, the auction model through technology. Thank you, Stefan. Hi, my name is Stefan von Barta. I'm the director and owner of the von Barta Gallery in Basel and Schamp. And we're not as old as Kunsthalle, but at least we're 50 years old, and I'm running the gallery in the second generation. Thank you. Um, Elena, Kunsthalle has traditionally had its finger on the pulse, you know, from Picasso, Monet, Jackson Pollock, everyone's been at Kunsthalle Basel. Yet it is an institution of the very long tradition, which at times also means that it's difficult to change the working mode. What char characteristics of the tech world or the startup world would be something you as an institution could learn or benefit from? Um, I think you put your finger actually on this, the particularity um, of Kunsthalle Basel, that it is on the one hand extremely old, and as you say, everyone um, who has gone on to make art history has shown there. And on the other hand, because that history has been one of always working with artists to think new ideas, new productions, to think the now, it has always done things a bit differently. Um, from the format of its exhibitions to the way it speaks to its public. Um, so we have, you know, very early on tried to think about how we welcome an audience that can't even be physically within the spaces of Kunsthalle Basel. And that was, you know, before uh, the age of closing museums down because of COVID. Um, certainly we have a lot to learn uh, from the tech world. Certainly I think our two um, sort of industries could speak better to each other. There's this divide that, that separates us. But if one thinks about this incredible content and archive and history that an institution like ours has as the oldest um, institution for contemporary art in Switzerland and one of the oldest in the world, um, if we would find a way to sort of partner with um, technology, we could be a veritable Wikipedia of the 20th and 21st century in terms of art history, because sort of everyone has passed through those doors and gone on to um, leave a mark on, on that history. And it's just a question of finding a way to catalyze it, to mobilize it, so that a wider public than the one in Switzerland or the one that knows us already um, can have access to that information. Mm. That was a quick version. Thank you. Yeah, so, but, you know, I guess just thinking access differently than, than maybe we would, sort of maybe also not having, yeah, that tradition backing you up that, is, that maybe hinders sometimes. Thank you. Stefan, as a gallerist, which areas of your work most require innovation? And uh, do you feel that technology aided accessibility of artists threatens your maybe raison d'etre or maybe, you know, put differently, do you think Instagram changes your job profile? Uh, changes my job profile? Yeah, it has changed my uh, job for profile because I'm spending way more time on Instagram than I have before. Um, I would have never guessed that this is going to become such an important tool. Um, but to come back to your first question, you know, the parts of the gallery job that you that I feel like need innovation, 
um, it's difficult to say because I think all areas need to a certain level of innovation. Um, we've never had much of a change, you know, on how galleries and uh, and also, you know, the whole art world is being run. You know, it's still a very classical business. A lot of things are still being run like they have been running 20, 30, 40 years ago. I think the only big change has been that social media and sources such as Instagram, but also, you know, a website and so on has become more important uh, have become an important tool for us uh, in the last couple of years, and especially now during these uh, during the pandemic. Um, but I think to really point out a field that needs to improve is very difficult because I think all areas need to change more than improve. Because I think change is a very interesting interesting aspect for every business, and the art world hasn't uh, undertaken too much change. Uh, so I feel also that this whole pandemic is a big opportunity to push that. And to talk about Instagram, um, for us, it has just been a very interesting you know, experience to use it uh, for the gallery, to use it with the artist, to use it to inform about the activities of the gallery, um, to use the live tools that you have uh, within this, uh, this um, app, so to say. But nevertheless, it's still, it's still, uh, it is of course a wonderful thing to have, but it's still not um, really pushing um, the gallery to the level where it becomes an important sales tool. Um, so a lot of people say they do sell via Instagram. We, we do from time to time, but it's still more a source um, of, of informing about what we do and our activities uh, instead of really seeing it as a sales tool. Excellent. So it hasn't put you out of business because artists can be approached directly. I guess you have contracts with them anyway. Stefan, briefly. Oh, sorry. I just said that Instagram, uh, you know, it's always being the artists forward their messages to us. Uh, and, you know, we are. It's, it's like a family, you know, we don't, uh, we haven't had anyone that has been approached via Instagram and hasn't shared that with us, but of course you could, but I think, no, that's not happening. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Matt, how could, you know, also having heard now Elena's perspective and Stefan's and previous ones, how could the Lightroom have supported you on your quest with my art bank up, up until this point? And maybe share briefly what my art bank is. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you. Um, so basically, my art bank is a platform which is intended to ultra high network individual. We are trying to reshape the way that art is being traded by going through a fully digitalized process where we have connected a collection management system to a marketplace. And then we are trying to facilitate the different services over one platform. So this is basically what my art bank is. Um, but one of the things that, uh, that I learned as an entrepreneur was that you have you have a great vision, you have some, some great ideas, and um, you have also a power of going to conquer the world, um, but you might not have the right connection. You might need some, some guidance as well, and you definitely do not have all the resources uh, available. And there I see uh, an important factor could be the light room because you will have the opportunity to interact with leading members in the art world at a very early stage, and that is definitely something that could have helped myself um, throughout the entire process because when you can learn and, and adapt from the different actors you can create a more sustainable product as well yeah okay thank you um stefan maybe without physical art fairs the cost of running uh, medium to large galleries have been drastically reduced while sales have also gone down considerably now that you can't interact with collectors or at art fairs have you found new ways to interact with new ex uh, and existing customers? Who told you? Uh, who told you that sales have dramatically gone back? <laughs> well, actually, I haven't. Maybe they've gone dramatically up. <laughs> no, but. No, no. But sales sales have of course changed uh, i think you know when the whole when this whole pandemic started and you know we were faced by by this news of art fairs not taking place we did not really know um what that would mean and of course we were very scared of that um of these circumstances 
But what we um, realize is that we are in a very fortunate position, especially in Switzerland, to have a lot of uh, local collectors. And we were able to reach out to them, you know, in the times when the gallery was open, and we were able to welcome a lot of people to the gallery. And uh, we've really changed our business concept from taking very good care of the people that we already know and try to reach out to everyone that we know to be really an attractive place to go and visit and to interact with the exhibition and our artists and also us as a team. Um, so this is something that we definitely reinforced in comparison to what we've done in the past, where of course that was very important as well, but it was always a kind of a 50-50 situation. You had your local contact, but you were always going to the fairs to meet new people, to meet more people. Um, but we've been very, um, I think we've done a quite good job, or my team, not me, my team has done a very good job in really um, uh, making it an, an attractive place for, for our local collectors and friends and artists to come and visit. So we were able to, to really interact with a lot of people. But of course, we are missing the fairs, um, but it hasn't been as dramatic as we initially thought. Um, because I think, you know, in general, you know, there was a lot of talk about uh, the importance of fairs and I think they are very important and we miss them a lot, but it's also interesting for us to see how it is without fairs. And it's also very interesting for us to have a bit of an old school attitude in, in making the gallery space important again and really having the gallery space as a place to meet and really putting more effort into the shows here at the gallery uh, than maybe what we've done in the past to be brutally honest. Mm, thank you. And Eleanor, how has this affected your way of, you know, looking for artists, interacting with them, uh, and, and just a, a, an ex having an exchange, maybe setting up or planning an exhibition? And how do you think, um, ha have there been positive aspects to it maybe as well? Or, you, or how, could it, how could technical tools have helped you better? Well, certainly there's nothing that replaces the live in terms of being able to sit in front of an artist and have a long conversation um, or with an audience in terms of taking them through the show. I know it's an ongoing debate between um, audiences and institutions about in a time of, of closures, of museum closures, of inability for, um, for us to, to have our raison d'etre um, realized because we um, are all about making art and exhibitions public um, and sharing what we do. Um, in those moments, how do we still keep an attachment to artists? How do we still manage to um, give them access to art? And one of the things that we have um, done and kind of use the opportunity to innovate um, with uh, in our institution is to realize we're not going to try to replace the institution um, or the exhibition and the experience of being with an artwork, but we are going to try to give an audience um, access to the process of making art, to the conversations that we are privy to with artists. Um, we've taken the opportunity to make little films that would be, um, and I'm sorry, I think that's my um, messages going crazy um, that it's um, <laughs> distracting sorry um, that we we've made these little films that accompany the process of making art um, and share that with an audience or interviews things that we we frankly didn't have the time to do in a moment when we were we make eight exhibitions a year countless book launches and events usually and the slower pace meant that we invested time and digital tools in finding a way to bring a public alongside the process that they normally wouldn't see. We've also made the sort of investment in our photo archive a new kind of priority. Um, at the beginning of this talk, we, you know, you, you mentioned the long tradition, the long history of Kunsthalle Basel, and you know, in the process of always having to make shows one after another, it's hard to take the moment to stop and to look back and to kind of straighten straighten up the archive. So we're, um, we're really looking into that and how this archive can be a tool for an artist 
um, in the making of their work for an audience to understand what has come out of this you know little town of Basel. You know, it's just incredible what the history of artists who have been through Basel and sort of shown at Kunsthalle Basel have been, and um, and to make this this history a more public one. That's what we've been doing, um, and that's how we've been using technology and thinking with web programmers and um, thinking about how Instagram as a platform, you know, again, won't replace the exhibition experience, won't replace art. I'm still very old school in that way, but it nevertheless will alert people um, that we are, you know, in what we do and bring them into the process of thinking with and alongside artists in the production of new work. Mm. When we talked yesterday, you mentioned, you know, a certain spirit of how Instagram came to be and how you um, wished that maybe that's what, what, we, what could come out of this. Would you mind sort of sharing that again? Sure. Um, you know, actually, I was, you know, we all know about and maybe use Instagram, but I, you know, found this little story that actually um, um, Claudio, our press person, brought to my attention that Instagram, in fact, was previously called Bourbon um, in its previous iteration, that it was, you know, really the story of, you know, a few friends in a room sitting around um, with their favorite spirit and inventing an app that um, had various features, many, too many features, and, and then kind of testing it, trialing it, and realizing that the one thing that people really loved about this app, Bourbon, um, that nobody's heard of basically, was the image sharing part. And, you know, a few iterations later, they rename it Instagram. And it's, you know, the story that we all know, but I guess, I thought with Lightroom, one of the things that was really exciting about this idea of bringing together tech entrepreneurs and people working and committed to culture was that we, in, in essence, could be these friends in a room um, around a spirit. Um, we'll know better than to call it bourbon, but to, um, to just think the big thoughts, to think the big ideas, and to come up with the thing that has, hasn't been thought yet. And for any tech entrepreneur or person who is looking to invent ways for something erratic and special um, and impactful as art and to bring it to a public in new ways, um, you know, without this wanting to be a pitch, like I've got content, you know, like Kunsthalle Basel has this incredible archive of the 20th and 21st century. Um, and it's longing to be mobilized, to be rendered uh, public in, in even more interesting and innovative ways. And if this institution has been one that's always been at the forefront in terms of how it thought about working with artists, I would like it to also be able to be at the forefront with how it works with technologies to bring that long history to an even wider, more global public. Thank you. Uh, Matt, how does, how does this resonate with you? And have you had people to, you know, appears that you could actually flesh out stories that you or ideas that you are really quite that passionate about? I mean, it's, it's quite an interesting uh, topic also by making art accessible to, to everyone. I think one of the things that I'm quite uh, interested in seeing the development on is uh, the fractional ownership and also, of course, as Dick Bone mentioned earlier in this conversation uh, regarding the NFTs and how this kind of entire new digital market will also affect uh, the galleries. Uh, it's something that I think is, is, uh, is a highly hyped topic at the moment, but it's also very interesting to see where, where will this spawn down and what, what kind of impact will it have on the galleries because if, if artists today now can can sell the, the artworks digitally, um, what does that mean for the galleries in the future? I think this is some of the the, the future um, development within the art sector that I'm very much looking forward to see how the galleries will be able to adapt this kind of technology. Mm, excellent, thank you. Um, to wrap this uh, discussion up, you know, feel free to ask questions to each other or otherwise I would like to 
briefly um, sum up your takeaways and what you would hope for the Lightroom to, to do for you going forward? Who will start? You. Go for it, Stefan. <laughs> No, it's always it's like in school where you gotta go. Does anyone have a question? Everyone goes quiet, you know. Um, no, I oh, think uh, I think that uh, you know I'm really interested to see you know how the Lightroom will continue this conversation between the different players because I think this is something that um, we've we've been always missing because it was very difficult from a gallery perspective to be able to reach out to different players within the art world. You know, with art fairs, it's always like, yeah, you have a, you have like a second agenda because you would like to participate with art fairs, with institution and curators. It's always like, yeah, you want to position one of your artists, you know, at that institution. So it's always been quite a, a difficult aura around the different players. And I think the beauty of, of this approach is really to, to have a very open conversation, you know, in these times, what can be done, what can be achieved on the tech side, which is a very important uh, conversation um, because we've been, for example, approached by so many different um, apps and tools and ideas and companies and everyone has the idea of the future and you feel incredibly kind of overwhelmed with all the options you know it, it used to be artsy now it's like seven different platforms offering the same thing as artsy does and it's just like you just don't know where this whole thing is going to go and you always feel like there's only one or two players within the art world really working on the on this idea so i'm super excited to see how that conversation of all the different players uh, will work out uh, so yeah it's going to be very exciting excellent thank you elena do you want to go next if um uh, sure in a way without meaning to i I sort of made uh, made a pitch or a call for uh, the entrepreneurs out there who might be inspired um, to to have a case study or to to you know to dig into a rich content and to be able to invent alongside an institution what its future could be um, in the realm of the digital. But I should also say that you know, even as I make that call or even as I would wish it, I also know that the future of these technologies are ones that need to be nimble enough that they recognize that what we're not trying to do necessarily is um, simply a one-to-one -one pasting of um, the real experience of being in an exhibition or being in front of an artwork and um, having a JPEG version of it that would be online or that would be on Instagram. Um, because as much as, you know, increasing number of people are buying art that way or consuming um, exhibitions that way, I still have this fundamental belief that um, there must be something more that, that can help a public, as I was, when I was speaking about the films that we've um, invested and started to make, you know, that can not replace the exhibition, not replace the art, but actually accompany the experience and enrich the experience of giving access to the many voices of artists that are working today and making this more accessible and then connecting it to the work that we do as an institution with artists and making new productions. Thank you, absolutely. I couldn't agree more coming f from an institutional background or you know, public art collection. M Mads, um, would you like to finish this round off? Yeah, I, I have something, uh, but it's more from, from the startup side. I mean, now I've gone through the entire process of um, having an idea, creating a business and raising the funds. And I believe in, in the art world, it's, it's quite a, a complex market and it's it's very often difficult to navigate yourself around um, and i believe um, institutions like the lightroom could help this entire process and make it way more efficient to put these kind of new innovative ideas onto the market because it is it is a market that's very difficult to 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 start up in because prior to COVID, people were very um closed if you can say it like that um, but what has happened during COVID is people have been forced to be more digitalized. People have been forced to interact in a new way. And it had at least make it a lot more easy for my art bank to, to connect with individuals all around the globe. 
um, but with, with, with an institution like the Lightroom where you can combine all these kind of leading, uh, leading actors, I mean, then you have the, the ability to create something fantastic in the, in the art market. And I'm really looking forward to see where we can, where we can get this project um, in the future. Excellent. Thank you so much for all of you. And um, I am happy to announce our next program uh, point, which is Nancy Gamboa and Sean Green. Nancy will shed some light on the challenges she's met with as an independent art advisor and where technology could help. Um, followed by Sean Green of uh, uh, sorry, of Arternal, uh, who shares some of his professional and personal experiences and challenges as the founder of a startup in the art industry as a computer scientist. Hi, I'm Nancy Gamboa. I'm an independent art advisor. I'm based in Los Angeles. I build collections of fine art and I do public projects um, and I've been doing that for about 10 years now. As a whole, my interaction with the art industry is just is high level of communication. Um, lots of um, interacting with my colleagues, um, very important. The, the human um, component is, is huge in the art world. Um, so um, it's looking on Instagram, it's researching, it's looking at catalogs resume, it's consulting with my colleagues who are experts in a field or, um, um, or on a particular artist. Um, it's uh, communicating with my clients on a regular basis and keeping them informed on the the um, on their areas of interest on anything like that um, galleries you know so it's it's just a high level of communication and exchange of information um, every day. The art business has always been kind of a rarefied handshake business that is all about access, and so um, the digital world really blows all of that kind of um, exclusivity open. And um, so I think they're kind of, they're a bit in conflict, but now we're seeing them kind of come together. We're seeing how they have to work hand in hand. Digital in innovation just means um, optimization. You know, um, how do we create experiences or um, systems that really work for us? For me, as an advisor, I'm getting tons of information all the time, previews from galleries, solicited and unsolicited. Um, I'm looking at artists who are emerging all the way to ancient. Um, so the amount of information that I have to hold on to at any given moment um, and access is a lot. So I need really great systems in place to be able to archive all of that so that I can wield that information and not just be overwhelmed by it. Um, as I always say, so in terms of the direction of, of you know, where the art industry is headed. I think that already we've seen how just Instagram alone has kind of blown open the doors of kind of exclusivity and access. Collectors who are on Instagram can reach out to artists directly. They can, it's, it's a first stop. Instead of going to the gallery website or even the artist website, um, or maybe even the art fair, we're, we're looking someone up on Instagram. We're like, where, where are they? We get the most up-to-date information on the studio, on what's happening at galleries. We get information on institutions. Collectors are very much more accessible too. And so um, I do think there's gonna be greater and greater transparency. Um, I don't necessarily think that that greater transparency is gonna equate to greater access. I do think that you still have to kind of go through the motions of becoming of, of kind of um, becoming a collector, becoming an art connoisseur, that kind of thing. Um, so we still have to do the work, you know, um, even though we have more information. I think the Lightroom could be useful in terms of just like um, providing really great tools for um, all the things that we talked about, which are, you know, video, images, how do we store all these things? How do we really create great systems for, um, for all of the information that we need to have in order to be able to provide for me, to provide my clients with, with all the resources that are at my disposal so that they can make a great decision about what art to acquire. Hi there, I'm Sean Green, co-founder and CEO of Arternal. We're a vertical business automation software for leading art galleries, auction houses, uh, art collectors, and we're focused on the art vertical, helping these businesses leverage better technology to be able to uh, garner the sale.
and build better relationships. Building my business from scratch in the art sector was not easy. I mean, I come from a technology background, uh, my background being in computer science and working with the art world has been an interesting one. They actually, uh, they're not tech averse, but slow adopters. And so that's what provided uh, a little bit of friction as we were trying to understand how to work in the space. I was definitely surprised by how the art industry conducts business. Uh, you're dealing with people who traditionally, you know, function. It's about the relationship purely. And so pen and paper, Excel spreadsheets, uh, you know, different manual documents to get the business side of things done. And the only form of technology that they knew was inventory management. So for us, it was about, you know, educating the space and educating and selling at the same time added complexity to us gaining adoption in the market. But we're excited that we <laughs> were accomplishing that goal. I feel, yes, it was difficult breaking into the art industry. Fortunately, one of my co-founders, Steve Miller, uh, was able to usher me in and, and give me uh, a little bit of a wedge in, but it still required a lot of extra muscle to be able to uh, break down the walls uh, of these businesses. It's a very opaque, closed industry um, where, you know, the relationship is everything. Trust is the currency that this industry trades on alongside information. And so for me, I had to gain the trust opening doors. The new museum incubator actually provided another uh, level of trust for people. And we were based out of there when we initially began. And so without these relationships, uh, it would have been a lot more difficult of, of a terrain. As an incubator, you know, yes, it's all about support. And I believe that the Lightroom, uh, it's important to have the right supporting cast because when you're building a startup or breaking into an industry or working uh, and focusing on a particular demographic or client group, you want to have people who can support, you know, the individuals who are going to participate in the incubator. And that means providing them with access, providing them with resources, maybe even providing them with capital, but surrounding them with the people that can help to accelerate what it is that they're working on is important. If the Lightroom were around when we started our terminal, because of their relationships that they have tied to the art world, I believe that it would have helped us usher in international presence, which is which is key for us. You know, now we're trying to you know break further you know from the walls of North America um, into Europe, and we have scattered clients there. But to be able to have that presence and the advisory, you know, they could be able to open us up to you know more of the European market. Being an entrepreneur in the art sector uh, is not an easy road. Uh, being a black entrepreneur in the art sector <laughs> provides its own level of complexities as well. But what's key is being able to stay the course. For me, I've devoted you know, almost the last decade of my life to this space. Uh, is there room for more entrepreneurs to come in? I think, of course, as this market continues to open up, as you're seeing, you know, the NFTs and the digital artwork and, you know, blockchain and these other technologies, it's early. Like, you know, the art market is it's in its infancy still when it comes to technology, which means it provides a, a lucrative opportunity if you can find yourself in the right laneway in this niche. Um, you know, a lot of dollars are traded in this space. You could quickly try and dive in and try and say, I'm just going to focus on the transaction. But if you build deep relationships as the industry is steeped in that mindset, I believe that there's a long, long way for you to go if you're thinking of diving into this space. Uh, but as the market would tell you, relationships are key and trust is a currency. After this uh, interesting input uh, of Sean and Nancy's, I'm now pleased to introduce Mathieu Paris. Uh, he's a senior director at White Cube uh, since 2015, one of the most influential influential galleries worldwide. 
Um, and now I'd like to remind you that you can ask questions through the chat function. Uh, Matthew, the last uh, 12 months, as we don't need to remind anyone, anyone of, uh, have been rather special with um, your work, usual working mode of um, auctions and art fairs um, being uh, fiercely abrupted. Which approaches worked well uh, and where could you identify a real lack in establishing personal relationships with galleries, artists and uh, collectors? Hi. Um, I think let's start with the one with the initiative that worked well from the beginning. Um, first of all, we had to face uh, an emergency and a shock when the whole COVID happened. And the first need has been to enter it on a charity side. Uh, we've been approached by many of our artists who wanted to help. So, Digital immediately helped us to uh, to face uh, to face this this need of uh, of charity and uh, supporting good cause. We white cube with uh, uh, with um, selling online edition from uh, several of our artists. I could uh, uh, we we started with Arlen Miller, with Michael Armitage, and uh, with Anthony Gormley, and we raised uh, by selling on an online platform through our website and through Instagram uh, over 2 million of uh, uh, COVID relief, of edition for COVID relief charities. So that's been the first uh, answer from uh, on the digital side from the gallery. After that, uh, we uh, we applied, we tried to apply on the, more, on the business side, we tried to apply the same kind of curatorial rigor uh, on a digital platform than we are used to apply on a physical uh, space, you know. So it was important to have the exact same uh, team of curators, the exact same team of director, but I mean the exact same team working on developing our online program, developing our online exhibition program, our OVR, and um, and uh, trying to uh, improve what's already been done by the past. Uh, we developed a program of online exhibition. Uh, we, from our, uh, from our uh, artists, uh, uh, we had, we last year, just after the uh, beginning of the crisis, we launched a very successful online exhibition of Tracy Amin. Uh, we also develop a new program called Introduction, introducing new artists, uh, emerging artists to our audience. And so far, it's been uh, actually emerging and more confirmed because one of them was Minoru Namata, which is an established Japanese artist. But uh, this has been an extremely uh, productive and interesting uh, program and been followed by a lot of. Uh, uh, collector and brought an amazing audience uh, to the gallery. So these are the um, the two initiatives that work very well from the beginning. On the art fair side, uh, it's been slower. It's been more. It took more time. And but the complexity of a digital art fair um, is uh, is understandable. You know. But even that, there have been some great online art fair, and uh, we just finished, uh, we just ended FIAC, the Parisian, the French Parisian art fair, who learned from uh, the last few months and who, I have to say, developed an incredible uh, uh, platform online with ArtLogic, and it's been extremely, extremely successful for, for us. So there have been great achievements this year. Mm. So do the digital experiences maybe, and maybe also the data you, you have from them influence um, the way you will curate or the programming going forward? Of course. Uh, we, we, collected, uh, we collected data, we improved our uh, experience. We, we learned from a collector uh, uh, to our online behavior this year, uh, more than ever, more than ever before, you know. 
Um, we are extremely present on Instagram since long time. We have almost 800,000 followers on Instagram. I believe we are the third largest uh, audience on Instagram. And we, we learn about who is following us. We, we develop OVR. We learn about who is looking at it. We got a complete new generation of collectors this year. Uh, we learn obviously that millennium collector looking at art to a mobile. So we had to adapt a format, a scale. Uh, we were not necessarily on a computer internet uh, based uh, scale. So yeah, we, uh, we, we improve, we improve our, um, our, our digital and uh, online presence a lot. So you think that might also um, change the, the type of artists you work with? So, you know, only two hours ago, Beeple has had this uh, historic uh, moment with Christie's. How does this sort of influence the gallery's program, maybe? Uh, <laughs> I learned uh, uh, learn this information in the same time than you, and uh, yeah, it was couple of hours ago, uh, I think it's a bit too early to pronounce uh, ourselves on this new uh, development of the art world. I personally uh, believe and stand uh, on behind a, rot, uh, a list of artists, you know, with whom we develop long years of relation or even for the, I mean, as I say, we're trying to apply it like with uh, curatorial rigor, you know, we're trying to uh, to to build a, compre a, 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 co a coherent program and uh, so we will apply this on a digital and uh, on the digital platform and there is no reason to go over the moon quickly you know and no we, we will follow what we always did and uh, it's been a great year we, we learned a lot but uh, I think we stayed honest with ourselves and, um, and we, we, we kept the same line that we always did. Mm. So, you new, know, on one, sorry. Sorry, using new, new tools, obviously. Yeah. So on one hand, it's been a disruptive year and I guess financially also um, difficult in some sense but also you have adopted new ways of communicating and getting in touch and a new client base, I guess, or um, what sort of other learnings you have taken maybe on a positive and upside that you will be developing further um, in the next months and years to come? I mean, financially, I have to say it's been a good year. Uh, we uh, obviously the first few months I've, I've been quite a shock and a bit difficult, but I have to say the art market uh, recovered quickly, you know, and we are a global market. So, you know, when Europe was a bit more traumatized, America was uh, in the pre-election process, but still very active. You, uh, Asia recovered uh, very well from the, uh, from the first wave, you know, and started to be more active at one point when America were more concentrated on the election. So obviously digital and online is something that help us to cover the, the, the globality of, of the market. And when there is one region or one area in the world a bit less active, there's always another one who, who, who is taking over. So um, we, we grew up a, a, a network, I think by 20%, uh, we, we we increase our mailing list by 37 percent actually i have a few uh, numbers on the front of me uh, instagram grown by seven percent so which means 52,000 new followers in six months um, and the time spent on the website has grown by 17 percent compared to the same period last year so yeah i it's important also to say that we were not forced, we were not urged uh, to, uh, to go online. We were already online. What we did is that we accelerate and we in intensified and amplified the scholarship around the OVR uh, online viewing room, the 
the content we were proposing to, uh, uh, to, to the viewer. We also created new initiatives. I mean, uh, Zoom helped us a lot organi organizing studio visits with the artists. We got an incredible uh, response, uh, not only from a collector, but from a gen more general public to, to the first uh, studio visit of uh, Tracy I mean online. It's been, people loved it. It's been, we, we, we received a lot of email like censor for that. You know, it was a way for collector in Asia or collector in Canada to, uh, to come to visit the studio of one of the most uh, important uh, English women artists today. Uh, the most important artists today. Hmm. Excellent, yeah, it's a good point. It's not that you weren't online before or had a big presence there but actually just grew it and scaled it and, and like everyone did, whereas, you know, you, you had a working mode already and that's, um, and, um, but it's also, I think it's an interesting point that it really can facilitate you break down barriers and, and invite new people in and in learning and enjoying art, I guess. Um, going forward, what would you hope for the Lightroom to be and, and, and yeah, how, when, uh, when Martin Atterbrook told me uh, first about this initiative, I found the idea absolutely genius, you know. Uh, as Stephen uh, and Thomas and my, uh, the president speaker were saying, we've been uh, bombarded by uh, initiative, uh, digital initiative from many sides, you know. And it's extremely complicated for, uh, um, for a gallery like us to go and investigate each of these uh, initiatives that come from very various and different uh, uh, sides. So obviously, uh, creating a platform that encourage, create, in incitate uh, discussion and sharing information is, is very important. Maybe, and I will make a call to uh, Elena Filipovic when I'm saying that, obviously, the digital will never, never replace the physical experience of an artwork. I, 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 I mean, we're doing this job because we love experiencing art, you know. Uh, and by this, I think I answer your question about, uh, about the Christie's setup today. But um, maybe I'm wrong. But no, we love, we do this, this job because it's our passion, you know. It's not, it's not only a job. We love experiencing art. We love speaking with artists. We love the physicality of the, out of it. And I think uh, if maybe if I have to uh, deplore, uh, I, I have to regret something, is that there were, there were no, this year, in the, since the beginning of the crisis, there were no digital answer to to bridge, to fill the visualization gap for collector and for audience. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm uh, expressing myself correctly, but uh, we need, there's still a, a, a barrier, there's still a border between the screen and between the, um, the uh, a direct environment, you know? And even as a sales tool, uh, we really need an app, we really need a program that help us to augment the reality, you know, of the of the artwork. Who who able uh, to place an artwork in a room like this online, and who 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 can really give more uh, um, more depth and more uh, reality to to art for a collector who is trying to buy online, you know. And it's real for two D work or two dimensional work like painting. Uh, but painting is still easier to access uh, through a screen. When you when it comes to sculpture, it's a real it's a real problematic. And I think it's. I mean, when it's an artist, a sculptor, you know, and people know it's easier, you know. But when you try to make this to 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 present the work on a, uh, of a new artist or to try to uh, open an audience for an artist in a different area. We really need a, a tool that help us to 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 give more substance, uh, uh, not to give more substance, but to relate more the reality uh, of an artwork. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. I think this is a great food for thought and a good platform for the Lightroom to start um, start thinking Excellent. and working. Amazing. Thank you Amazing. so much. Yeah. Next up, I am uh, happy to introduce the interview with Mark Spiegler and Noah Horowitz, which we pre-recorded last week. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm especially pleased to be able to introduce Mark Spiegler and Noah Horowitz. They have both had their finger on the pulse of the entire art market for the past two decades. Having an incredibly important role within the art market ecosystem as the global director and director of Americas at Art Basel. Welcome to the Lightroom Summit, Mark Spiegler and Noah Horowitz. We would like to um, have a, a short conversation to you about uh, possibilities and um, challenges the art market and especially art fairs have had over the last year and how we could uh, bring them forward. Mark, how would you define the role of the art fair in the context of the art world in general, maybe as a community builder, connector between buyers and sellers or institutions and artists? I mean, I'm going I'm to talk about the fairs as we knew them and as I assume we will know them moving forward. I think the, the art fair started as a way to connect buyers and sellers, but I think especially over the last 15 to 20 years, they've really evolved as this, into this place where the whole art world comes together. You know, in, even, you know, there used to be this saying that artists didn't come to fairs. You, you see many of them now, you know, and the reality is that the fairs, like the biennials, are one of the places where you see many different parts of the art world and more specifically, people coming from all over the world. In a sense, you know, if you're trying to get a tour d'horizon of the, of the scope of the art world, the fairs are very quick and efficient way to get a sense of what's going on in different places and decide where you want to dive in deeper. Um, and so the fairs are not just a place where, where galleries sell to collectors, but they're also a place where museums go to galleries to seek support for their shows. They're also a place where museums go to seek acquisitions. They're also a place where curators will look for young artists coming from other parts of the world. They're also a place where journalists will, you know, amass a lineup of stories for the next 10 months. And I think, you know, from that standpoint, the fairs are one of the primary places where, where the art world comes together, you know. Okay. Um, and Noah, COVID has had a huge impact on the entire art world, as Mark has just highlighted, not only the fair, but also the biannuals, uh, the museum shows, the gallery shows, etc. Um, how do you feel this will impact the art world in the long run? And will there be a fun fundamental paradigm change or has it impacted the sense also of community of the art world or where has the art world community gone in that time? Yeah, I mean, I, in the end, that's the million dollar question. Um, uh, Pre-COVID art fairs and events writ large constituted a larger and larger portion. Obviously, 2020 reset that fully. Um, and there's a lot of directions this can go on the other side, certainly from within our platform, starting already with the Hong Kong show in May and the interest we've received, even uh, given the, the uh, challenges uh, that, that present themselves for May, but also as we move forward into the second half of the year, we're, we're seeing extraordinarily resilient interest in returning to the shows, both on behalf of the galleries themselves, as well as interest. Um, certainly on the collector side. So I think from within the broad posit that seeing and experiencing art in person will be a fixture of our world, which is something that we on the Art Basel side absolutely ascribe to. I think there's an interesting place for the resilience of these events and, and, and the kinds of platforming and communities that we bring together. Clearly, on the other hand, the growth of the digital in the last year, and we'll be seeing a lot of data and analytics around uh, the trajectory of e-commerce from within the art sphere. We see that through the rollout of the OVRs that we ourselves started with Hong Kong already a year ago in March. And on through the rest of the year, we've, we've now launched within the Art Basel platform alone, setting aside what else is happening within the art fair and auction and e-commerce universe. Uh, standalone OVRs, we've had a, a, a huge amount of interest already for OVR Pioneers, which is our next standalone um, digital only platform on uh, the latter half of March. So coming out of this, I think we're going to see a world in which there's going to be resilience around being back in person and seeing art in the flesh again. 
but also a renewed appreciation around what the digital holds as a connective tool, as an analytical and research tool, and of course, also transactionally in terms of supporting buying art, looking at art and the whole platform of services around that. Um, certainly one of the interesting finds of the past year when we speak to galleries, and we saw this already in the mid-year report that um, we published in partnership with UBS that Claire McAndrew wrote, is that a lot of the sales that galleries were generating in a COVID environment weren't just to new people, but were in large part to their existing clients. And a lot of the clientele, whether uniquely or supported by the advisor and professional community is now buying online. And so that trajectory that, that the digital is just for this other universe of, of younger collectors or new collectors really wasn't the case. Um, we'll see more data around this, but I think the bigger picture thing here is, is how this comes together in a hybridized format, how digital reinforces uh, the live events that we run um, and that our industry is, is, is so adept at constituting both in, in the art fair landscape, the gallery landscape, and the biennials auction clearly outside of that as well. Mark, I don't know if you want to add to that. I would say one of the really interesting things that has happened during the, the pandemic period has been the degree of collaboration we've seen, unprecedented collaborations. I mean, I think on the Kunsthagen in Basel, for example, was a good example, was where, where everybody came together from the Basel community, small galleries, big galleries, nonprofits, museums. You know, we staged a, a version of parkour, for example. Um, likewise, in LA, we saw a group of galleries uh, pull together gallery platform LA. And I think in general, this has been a time where people lay down their arms and work together to get through it. And I, I like to think that that will come, that will stick, stay, stay with us on the other side, the sense of collaboration and, and unity and, and doing things for each other with each other. And maybe also being thrown out of the, the habit of this is how we always did it and, and sort of let, let's regroup and rethink and, you know, make the best out of a bad situation in a way. So now, do you feel that young galleries will start to embrace online first approaches more in the future? And what kind of impact do you think that might have on the on the market in general? Well, I think all galleries are going to embrace these uh, digital first initiatives in the future. I think one thing that we've seen through our platforms and our channels over the last calendar year is the adept uh, the adept with which many of our galleries, not just the mega galleries that have a lot of resource and have done this stuff for years, have allocated towards um, contextualizing work that's now being presented online um, and really storytelling in that space. And I think that's going to continue. Um, it is labor intensive. It can be cost intensive, but there's a lot of tools and technologies out there to help mitigate that. But I think it's about taking it seriously, right? And understanding how one is presented in this digital realm, which is very different than in uh, one's normal place of business, which is again, very different from within the art fair environment that many galleries over the last years have, have become very adept at navigating. So I think that's clearly going to accelerate. COVID also created a pause for galleries to reassess fundamental things that were pressing them to the limits. Um, we've heard many galleries say that Although sales were down last year, their cost base is also down in many instances, even more so proportionally, right? So many galleries were able, um, also supported by the way, through for, from um, public support, whether it's PPP loans in the US market or others elsewhere to kind of net out in an okay way last year. And that's a great finding from what we've learned anecdotally and what we're now seeing in data from speaking to galleries, but that in itself isn't necessarily sustainable. And I think um, this moment is going to force all galleries as it will also force all art market actors in the broader sense to really rethink some of their priorities. And there'll be a huge reliance in all of this on digital tools uh, and so on. I, I talked to a gallery yesterday whose gallery is still closed and the, the gallery relayed to me that even post COVID that they're, they're thinking of reducing the number of days that they may be open precisely because they've learned to, to create an adept way of essentially showing institutional audiences and their collectors through their actual exhibition programming um, when there's, when they're, when they're not necessarily open. So there will be 
a lot of different ways in which technology is leveraged to rethink relationships with your clients, as well as the extent to which you can promote and really drive value for the artists that are in your stable, both younger artists as well as estates. Mm. And how do you see the role of the fair growing as an influencing factor into, uh, you know, maybe amplifying of not just what is going on with the industry right now, but also what might be possible going forward? What, what's the role of the fairs there? I mean, if I answer the question correctly, what you're asking is, is our role not just to talk about what's happening, but also to think about the future? And I think, yes, absolutely. And I think to some degree, we're always thinking about the future. And some of those thoughts we keep to ourselves because we're developing things that we only want to announce once we feel like they're ready to come to market. And obviously, there's a lot of things we develop that we never bring to market. On the other hand, I think it's it's really interesting in formats such as these, you know, but also in some of the essays we've had, you know, on the parts of, of various writers on our website, conversations, you know, it, at the fairs themselves. It's interesting to think ahead, you know, what is the future of the art world? You know, on the other hand, you know, I've been asked so many times in, in more than a dozen years at Art Basel, where's the art world going next? You know, where's the art fair going next? And I think the, the best answer is always go to the studios of the artists, because like wherever the artists are going next is where we need to go next. You know, whatever it is, that the great artists of the future will need in their platforms is what we need to provide. And so in that sense, thinking forward has always been part of our, part of our, our brief and part of our success. Mm, yeah, true. Um, and Noah, um, which areas of the art market ecosystem are currently most lacking in innovation and where are the biggest challenges uh, from your point of view or maybe also from Mark's point of view? Or, I mean, there's clearly a lot. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think one thing, and this has come through the research that we've published annually with with UBS and, and that Claire McAndrew drives is, um, you know, galleries access to capital, right? Um, the art business is a capital intensive business, very costly uh, to maintain a bricks and mortar space, to undertake all of the travel, um, all of the, 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 the various fees that are very steep, the reward with which is often pushed back. So something to, to, to tackle some of those fundamental things to create better access to capital um, for galleries to help normalize payment flows. Um, cash flow management is, is a huge thing. That's a, a big picture thing. Um, innovation as such is also uh, a, a huge thing. I think we speak a lot about digital innovation. The art market is, is sort of turned on its head over the course of the last year. Again, taking galleries and also collectors, frankly, on that journey, on that journey is, is going to be huge. Helping to support galleries and also artists in that process. And then on the other side, creating a, a more empowered platform for buyers of art and collectors of art to manage their collections and manage their acquisitions and to create the kind of customer journey in our world that one is accustomed to in all other aspects of, of e-commerce, of internet-based banking and other types of things, there's a gap there. Um, it's, not been, it's not been connected yet. And I think we can play an important role as we're already doing uh, with the OVRs and so on and so forth and, and bringing these things together. I, th I think those are two really big ones. Um, Mark, I don't know if you want to add to that uh, as well, but um, from my vantage, I'd, I'd say those two things are, 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 are paramount. No, I think that that pretty much summarizes it. I mean, I think the pandemic really pushed a lot of people who'd been very slow. I mean, I think in general, the art world has been quite reactionary, quite conservative for embracing the digital. And I think, you know, necessity is the mother of, of invention, but also of innovation. And so in a sense, What's been great to watch is how creative people have been when they've been forced to be. Thank you both. Um, and thank you again for having had this uh, insightful conversation. And I am hoping very much that we will experience three of our Basels in person this year again. Us too. Thanks so much. Me too. Thank you so much, Miriam. Right. After so many rich inputs and plenty of needs and wishes and hopes and food for thought for the Lightroom, I am now introducing the last put two inputs by co-founder Carolina Danko and Peter Winyates. And it's also um, for me to say goodbye and thank you all for staying with us for the last two hours. And I'm looking forward to many 
many inspiring exchanges. Thank you. Thank you so much for having been part of this event. We really hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We hope you learned a lot. We hope you have more questions and more inputs. And this is a member-based community, so please join the Lightroom. The fee is 100 Swiss francs per year, and we very much hope to have you on board. So that was our first event. Um, a quick summary for those of you who may have missed the beginning. What is the Lightroom? Well, it's a think tank, an incubator, an accelerator rolled into one. And by creating a global platform and facilitating the discussion for the entire ecosystem, we hope we can enable a productive, a lively and constructive debate between the art world and tech entrepreneurs. By connecting these two very different mindsets, we believe we can solve some very complex problems. Um, you have a world that has been very slow in adapting to change, as we heard before, a world that is also incredibly complex. It sets its own rules and pace and can be incredibly hard to understand for someone standing on the outside. Um, but we also have the fast paced MVP, rapid prototyping, go fast and break stuff attitude of the tech industry. A mindset that doesn't care much about the past, but has the ability to solve extremely complex problems with very innovative solutions. Will some summits to take place around the art fair in Basel in September, um, hopefully physically again, um, to include startup pitches, a hackathon with challenges from art world incumbents and members, so uh, startups, please get in touch. Um, and if you have any questions, input or ideas, um, please do get in touch with us. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. Um, we've learned so much already from this first event um, and next ones uh, we hope to make more interactive for you. And um, we promise actually. Um, so that <laughs> leaves me with nothing else to say today than thank you. Um, to all of our guests, um, everyone that's become a member already, um, of course, to uh, Miriam Baich for the wonderful moderation of this event, um, to Simon Ramsayer who created the videos, um, Ala at Ahoy Motion for the animations, and of course, um, Swisscom for providing this platform that we're using, and uh, the City of Basel for their support so far. And especially uh, to all of you who have been watching this event. Thank you very much. Goodbye.